you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I'm just going to start by thanking the uh, professors that uh, organized uh, this this evening. Appreciate what you do, uh, the fact that you took the time out. Uh, a lot of folks do programming during the Indian Heritage uh, Month. Uh, little of it is uh, substantive. Um, so the fact that you provided us this forum gave the state an opportunity, which they sadly uh, did not take advantage of. Uh, so they're forced now to have me describe their position, which is never a position we're be in. Uh, how many of you are uh, students? Great. Other faculty? Faculty, raise your hand. Terrific. Anyone from the media? Sweet. Then I can really tell you the story. Right. Um, and just to be clear, anyone from the Attorney General's office come tonight because they want to settle, because they're scared of the... <laughs> <laughs> All right, just check. <coughs> check. Uh, I want to walk you through, very briefly, a timetable of events beginning roughly with the recognition of the three tribes and leading up to the point a couple months ago when we decided that we had no choice but to sue the Acting Attorney General of New Jersey uh, on this issue. Uh, and as we go along, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, please take notes. We'd love to answer questions in the Q&A uh, period about this. Um, but in the 1980s, late 70s, early 80s, states, not just New Jersey, began to recognize that they had a lot of repair work to do when it came to the relationship between the state uh, and tribes. So among the first things they began to do was to recognize the tribes as state-recognized tribes. And that occurred for three uh, tribes in New Jersey. The mechanism in New Jersey for recognizing the tribes was a concurrent resolution. Does anybody know what that means? Any government majors in here? All right, a concurrent resolution simply means that both houses of the legislature get together and unanimously approve a resolution that says something. It doesn't go to the governor for his signature, but in this case, as you'll see, it doesn't matter. Both the House and the Senate say, this is what our policy is, this is what our belief is. In 1995, so between 81, 82, 95, everything's hunky-dory, right? Everyone in the state, the Fed, says, great, New Jersey finally has three of its tribes recognized, no issues. In 1995, the state passes a law creating the Commission on Native American Affairs. And it says in the law, uh, we're going to reserve seats on this council for these specific tribes, and it names them. Uh, around about that time, 93, 95, Governor... Florio sends a note to the federal government in response to this standard inquiry that the federal government makes of the states. Every couple of years, the federal government says to the states, remind us again how many state tribes you have. Is it more than you had in the past? And so you'll see these New Jersey governors writing back to the state saying, we've got three recognized tribes in New Jersey. In 1999, the state passes another piece of legislation, and it authorizes these tribes to review and approve the birth certificates of children born in their communities. Anyone want to guess why they gave them that special authority? Took it away from state bureaucrats, gave it to these guys. Any guesses? Because they're a tribe. Because they're an official government tribe. That's, that was certainly a piece of it, but historically, why would there be a concern about birth certificates? Anyone know? Citizenship. For Yes, ma'am. Uh, running for offices or political office or anything? Nope. Well, that's a good idea. Any guesses? Because the state used to have people on its payroll whose job it was to change birth certificates that were native or mulatto to either black or white. In Virginia, there's a guy named Walter Plecker who for 50 years his job for the state was to sort people into two boxes, black or white. Why? It made it easier to divide the races and treat them in different ways. So if you were something in between, you got to recategorize. And so finally, New Jersey said, you know what? 
we don't even trust our own bureaucrats to stop this process. We're going to give that power to the tribes. In 2000, uh, every 10 years, you know, the federal government says, all right, states, how many people live there, what do they look like, what kind of cars do they drive, how many Native Americans you got. In 2000, the state said to the federal government, we've got three tribes. Also around this time, 2000, 2001, the state passes another piece of legislation, and it says, going forward, any other tribes in New Jersey will be recognized by a specific piece of legislation. The law doesn't say, we're retroactively applying this to all the tribes we've recognized already. If the law wanted to say that, it would say it, but it doesn't. It says, going forward, uh, new tribes in New Jersey will be recognized by statute. Now, here's where it gets fun. The relationship that New Jersey set up was between the commission, this Native American commission, as a liaison between the tribes and their governments and the state government and the federal government, like a triangle, right? So any correspondence is addressed from the feds to the commission as representative of the tribes. So in 2001, the feds say again, hey, how many tribes do you have in New Jersey? And instead of the commission responding, the letter gets picked up by someone in the gaming division, which is a subdivision of the Attorney General's office, and they, without telling the commission, write back and say, what tribes? we got no tribes in New Jersey. Right. So pause there for a second and recognize that when that response was given to the federal government, the federal government acted like someone had uh, not had their medication in the morning. Because they had been treating these tribes as they recognized, they knew nothing had happened. And so they continued on treating the tribes as recognized. In fact, most divisions of the state continue treating the tribes as recognized. And then, in 2012, the commission finds out secondhand, not directly, but secondhand, that an employee of the state has written to the General Accounting Office, which is a federal agency, uh, that was doing a study mapping all the tribes in the country and says, you know what, we don't have any tribes in New Jersey. And when we finally figured out and traced it back, we traced it back to the Attorney General's office. And when we con confronted the Attorney General, what he said was, you know, I really, I'm persuaded by this letter from the gaming division from 2001 that has sat in someone's file and has been ignored since then. We're going to adopt that as our policy. <coughs> I'm going to switch over to the next slide here. I promise I'll wrap this section up uh, uh, quickly. <coughs> In 2002, the state looked to this tribe because this tribe brought litigation against a municipality in northern New Jersey that was attempting to destroy an important archaeological site called the Black Creek site. And the state needed someone to stand up and defend the historic preservation process in the state. And it looked to this tribe, and this tribe was, after six years, uh, successful in doing that. In 2006, Governor Corzine, aware that there is, uh, in 2001, this letter out there, commissions a report, a study. And that study commission issues a report and says, we've looked at this. There are three tribes in New Jersey. In 2010, the federal government again asks New Jersey, in the census, how many tribes do you have? New Jersey says three. And so in 2012, we get to the point where we have this employee who, behind the back of the commission, tells the federal government, we've got no tribes here, and then we trace it back to the Attorney General's office. At which point, my favorite clients call me and said, we need to go talk to the Attorney General. And we did that in the Governor's office for shy of two years. The reason we stuck with it for so long is because the Attorney General's office offered to consider signing a letter that would retract the 2001 letter. And that would retract the statement by that state employee. In fact, I went back and forth with eight different drafts with staff in the Attorney General's office, tweaking the period here, a semicolon there. We were within hours of having the Attorney General say, oops, sorry about this mess. Officially, when something happened in New Jersey, anybody want to guess? The bridge, the bridge scandal. Right. Literally on the same day, 
that they were going to fix the mess that they made, they stepped into a bigger pile of trouble. Right? <laughs> and so what happens when you have a scandal that big? People try and save their asses. Right? And so that's what they spent the next eight months doing. Not dealing with any of the business of the state and certainly not paying attention to uh, my modest uh, clients. So we waited for eight months. And then we re-engaged after people had been indicted and you know the office staff had been shifted around again. We engaged with new folks. And the same letter was circulated again. And there were promises, we're going to uh, retract this if we can get the political folks in the governor's office to do it. But by that point, something else had happened. Anyone want to guess? Chris Christie decided that he had done enough good for New Jersey. He was now going to help the country the same way he had helped New Jersey. <coughs> I'm not a chief or a minister, uh, so I can be as impolite as possible. Uh, and by that point, they were off and running. Now, uh, we had no choice at that point to file in federal and state courts. I want to jump into the obvious questions about why they are behaving this way that you will surely have. Uh, let me just run you through the basic contours of the lawsuit. Anyone want to go to law school? Don't. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We can talk afterwards. Uh, so, uh, I, it is my honor, really my deep honor, my firm's honor to uh, represent uh, these guys. If we have a little bit of time later, I'll tell you how we first met and a little bit more about the battles that we've had before we got here because they really have been the highlight of not just my professional career but um, some of the high points of my personal uh, life. Uh, we have a New Jersey uh, firm that we partner with because I am not, as you heard earlier, a licensed New Jersey attorney. I have no immediate plans to be. But courts can allow you to practice in New Jersey called, uh, in, in a Latin phrase it's called pro hoc vice. It means for these purposes uh, only. And they allowed me to practice in a previous case representing the tribe, and the court has allowed me to practice uh, in this case as a contemporary New Jersey attorney. Uh, but we have a local attorney, and uh, he's with the firm Barry Corrado and Grassi, and Frank Corrado, who's a partner there, is a former uh, president of the ACLU in New Jersey, so he knows constitutional law. He's a terrific asset. The person the office we are suing is the Acting Attorney General of New Jersey. Why do I say acting? Anyone know? It's been this way. Yes, ma'am. Because no one's been appointed because of all the other stuff that's going on. Amen. Right? He is the longest serving Acting Attorney General of New Jersey <coughs> because the previous Attorney General resigned because of a Senate appointment and the Governor has not put him in front of the legislature to be confirmed. Uh, his acting status isn't relevant, but I wanted to point that out to you. Uh, we're suing in two courts. I could go into all the uh, details about why that is, but we're suing in federal court out of uh, Camden and in state court and in Trenton. This is a civil rights lawsuit. Uh, and the reason it's a civil rights lawsuit is because it is illegal for a government to make a decision to either give or take away benefits based on false assumptions about characteristics related to a, uh, an individual or a group's race. Uh, the false assumption that folks in New Jersey are making in the political sense is that if you're a Native American tribe, you want to open a casino. Right? The fact of the matter is, despite popular culture, the vast majority of tribes in this country don't have casinos and have no plans to open casinos. But that's not what you see on TV, right? And it's not what these politicians will take the time to understand. So the fact that they are making decisions to attempt to pretend as if 30 years of recognition don't exist, and they're doing it on an assumption that Native American equals casino is prohibited by the state and the U.S. Constitution. The relief we're asking for is injunctive relief. Anyone know what injunctive means? Yes, sir. Uh, is it like 
if you win a case in court, you don't get rewarded money, but like you kind of get something else out of it. Yes, that's right. It's a it's largely a non monetary relief, but you, the court is forcing someone to either do something or frequently not do something, right? So the injunction in this case would be the court or courts saying to the attorney general, stop pretending as if the past 30 years didn't exist, and stop telling the federal government that there are no, no tribes in, uh, in New Jersey, right? Uh, now, we're also asking for, in the state courts, compensatory relief, which means that this has damaged the tribe. It's damaged its business interests. We've had students who have lost scholarships. The fact that uh, we can't, our, our tribal folks can't sell products that are labeled <coughs> means that their price that they can get in the market is substantially lower. And there are folks, certainly many seniors within the tribe, that rely on that income. So there has been a financial component to this. But what we're really looking for at this point is the state to step up and do the right thing, or at least stop doing the wrong thing. So where the case stands now is that uh, we have filed uh, a complaint in two courts. The Attorney General's office has filed a motion to dismiss, which is generally what you do. Uh, in a motion to dismiss, you're saying, despite the 47 pages that Greg and his team put together, I don't see anything here that's worth talking about. The judge may this go away. Right? And then in the next week or two, we will file an opposition to the motion to dismiss, presuming the case survives. It'll then start what you typically see as the traditional uh, legal process. Um, uh, would you hold your question for just a second? I promise I'm almost uh, uh, done with this piece, and then I uh, and then we'll get to the next. Uh, because the Attorney General's office is not here, uh, I get the pleasure of describing what I think their position is, and then briefly telling you why I think that position is absurd, farcical, uh, and embarrassing. Uh, first, they say, we never recognize tribes, we just acknowledge them. Uh, the difference between recognition and acknowledgement appears, that distinction appears nowhere in the law or in practice. Right? The second is, they say, New Jersey's never had a process for recognition, except the fact that Governor Flory and other governors have described that exact process, concurrent resolutions, to the feds in the past. So, equally absurd. Uh, and that process included the fact that at the time that the tribes were recognized, the state legislature had committees that received evidence about the genealogical records and legitimacy of these tribes. So that's a process whether the Attorney General now wants to pretend it is or not. The next piece here is that uh, they argue that states don't have the power to recognize tribes. Uh, only the federal government does. Now, what do you remember about the piece of legislation they passed that said, we in New Jersey will recognize all future tribes by statute? Seems a bit contradictory that the is, legislature has said, we have the power to recognize tribes, and the Attorney General is saying, we don't have the power to recognize tribes. So we're going to let the judge try and sort that one out, because I can't make that one. Uh, and then finally, they're alleging that concurrent resolutions do not have the force of law. It is true that concurrent resolutions, for the purposes of other things in New Jersey, because they're not signed by the governor, do not have the force of law. But the federal government, when it looks to the states to ask the states, have you recognized their tribes, the federal government doesn't care. The federal government says you can do an executive order, you can do concurrent resolution, you can all gather at your grandma's house and decide that that's the way that you're going to do it. As long as the state has a process, it's good enough for the feds. And pretending it isn't good enough is, uh, is really a shame whack by the state at, at this point in the, uh, uh, in the tribe's history. So I'm going to pause there and shift it over to uh, Chief Gould and look forward to answering your questions. But uh, will you uh, cut us off? at any point, because with a chief and a minister and a lawyer, the fact that this isn't a two-day long uh, <laughs> seminar is really a miracle. But as uh, Chief Gould will demonstrate, he says more in fewer words than, uh, than the rest of us.